Thank you, Penelope. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the library again. Here, let me see if I can get the slides up. Play. Good, good. Um, for hosting us in this awesome uh, auditorium. So thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Penelope, and the whole uh, SFPL staff. Um, Letterform lectures are co-presented by the Letterform Archive and by the SFPL. And we'd also like to thank Adobe for generously sponsoring the video recording of this lecture series. So you can view all Letterform Archive Letterform lectures online just a few weeks after they happen by checking our website, letterformarchive.org. And the last three lectures in this series are already up now, so check them out. Um, Letterform Archive is also the home of Type West, which is a postgraduate certificate program in type design. We have a bunch of our students in the audience tonight, and I'll be looking to them for questions later on. So pay attention. Um, and in addition to the lectures, we also host uh, workshops, public workshops in a variety of topics relating to type, lettering, and design. And in fact, if you are considering a career in type design, or if you just want to add another tool to your graphic arts toolbox, um, applications for next year's certificate program will open on June 1st and close on June 30th. And our next public workshop is coming up on April 27 and 28. Um, you can learn to use your iPad for lettering with the amazing James Edmondson of Oh No Type Co. And our very own Type at Cooper West alum, Tad Wagner, who's in the audience tonight. Hello, Tad. Um, so ask him for questions uh, later on if you're curious. Um, so to find out more about these and other events or to see the videos of the previous lectures or just learn more about Letterform Archive and how to visit, go to letarc.org. Okay, so now let me introduce tonight's speaker, the inimitable Lars Kim. Um, I have known Lars for years and that's mostly in a professional context because she is uh, designer and letterpress printer working at Logos Graphics in San Francisco and at her own practice, Solskin Design. Um, Lars runs a Heidelberg windmill, which we all know is the Cadillac of the letterpress world, and somehow she still has all her limbs and digits intact after all these years. Lars is also a core instructor at the San Francisco Center for the Book, which is another venerable local institution dedicated to letterpress printing and book arts. And I'm going to collect my kickback later for that brazen plug. Um, I asked Lars for an amusing anecdote to tell as part of her um, introduction. And she sent me one yesterday, which uh, happens to be April Fool's Day. Mm -hmm. However, she assured me everything was true. So one of her ancestors was apparently a free-spirited crown prince from the Joseon dynasty who was known for his beautiful calligraphy. And he knew his younger brother, Sejong, would make a much better king than he would. So he feigned insanity and was banished from the court for his crazy behavior. And it seems to me like it might have been easier just to abdicate, but what do I know? Royalty is weird, you know? Um, anyway, so King Sejong took the throne and he became one of Korea's greatest rulers. He was responsible for many important innovations, including um, the development of the unique and incredible writing system known today as Hangul. So without further ado, I present to you the great, 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 great grandniece of King Sejong, Lars Kim. Everybody, how's everyone doing tonight? Woohoo! Can people hear me okay? Yep, okay. Uh, my name is Lars, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank the Letter from Archive, and especially Grendel, for inviting me here to give this talk. Uh, also, I want to thank the San Francisco Public Library for hosting this series. Um, 
also checking out this audience. I am amazed that this many people came out. Uh, so thank you all for your interest and for coming, um, for showing up. So we'll start off the evening with a little historical context, and we'll see how uh, Korean culture has been shaped by cultural and political forces, both near and far. And then we'll also look at the rise of Buddhism, and we'll see how Buddhism transformed Korean calligraphy and woodblock printing. And then from there, we'll dive into the invention of movable metal type. I think I see a few printers in the audience who might be interested in that, um, which preceded Johannes Gutenberg's Bible by 200 years, if not more. And then last but not least, we'll look at um, examples of contemporary type and print design in Korea. And we'll specifically, we'll see how Japanese and Western influences have helped shape or inform Korean type and print. What do we think? We ready to get going? OK. So first off, I bet a lot of you know where Korea is located, but I wanted to get us geographically situated. Um, here you can see Korea shown in light blue. And I'd like you to notice how it's sandwiched in between China and Japan. And also take a mental note, please, of where Mongolia is, because we will get to the Mongols in the lecture. But the reason why I show you this map is because I'd like to share an historical expression that's used by Koreans to describe their relationship to their Chinese and Japanese neighbors. And yes, indeed, Korea has been known as the shrimp caught between two whales. Oftentimes, those whales are fighting whales. We have China to our west and Japan to our east. And Korea has exchanged cultural and diplomatic ties um, with both countries, starting from the Bronze Age and moving forward. And uh, it's also been repeatedly invaded by both China and Japan for centuries. So its overall development can be described in having a type of push-pull kind of relationship with its neighbors. That being said, China had an enormous amount of influence on Korea. And from China, Koreans adopted their standards for art, and education, music, um, ideologies like Taoism and Confucianism, uh, which for those of you who don't know, is a, a set of social and political ethics centered around the teachings of Confucius, who was a philosopher from ancient China. Now, Koreans also adopted their writing system from the Chinese. And um, they used Chinese characters, which are called hancha in Korean, for centuries until the invention of the Korean script, which is called hangul, and that's shown below. And if you compare the two, you might observe how simple hangul looks in comparison to Chinese. And that's actually very intentional. Uh, Korean was specifically or purposefully designed to be easy to learn. Okay, going back to our map of Asia. Now we can follow the route that Buddhism took to travel via the Silk Road. And it originated in what is now India in around 500 BCE, came to China via the Silk Road by the first century, and then landed in Korea by the fourth century and this is a period when Korea was divided into three different kingdoms. And then from Korea, Buddhism was then transmitted to Japan in the 500s. And in this way, you can say that Korea served as a cultural bridge for ideas um, that came from the Silk Road uh, to Japan. And with the introduction of Buddhism came a rich new visual culture that involved advances in, te in technology, um, in which included calligraphy, papermaking, woodblock printing, and metal smithing. And all of these were used for both religious and royal purposes. And in fact, in the Goryeo dynasty, which followed the Three Kingdoms period, um, Buddhism and royal authority were very closely intertwined. All right. So now we have a great example of calligraphy, which is called soye in Korean. And this was introduced from China in the second or third century to Korea. And here we have a constellation map 
showing calligraphy inscribed in stone, which was one material which was used for writing, or in this case, inscription, uh, before paper was invented in China in 105. Other common materials used before paper in include bones, tortoiseshells, bamboo slips, and even silk. But this is actually a stone rubbing taken from a stele, uh, which dates later on in Korean history. This one comes from 1395. But it's a great example of how calligraphy and other important works could be reproduced easily. Um, yeah, rubbings developed in China in the second century before coming to Korea. And perhaps one of the most famous examples of calligraphy in early Korean history is the Great Dharani Sutra, which is shown on the right. Um, it's considered the world's oldest extant woodblock printed text, it dates from the eighth century. And it was discovered in the 1960s at a temple called Bulguksa, which is located in southeastern Korea. Um, the calligraphy in this document is in the style of Empress Wu, who was a great female uh, ruler from the Tang Dynasty in China. Uh, if any of you have time, I highly recommend doing a Google or Wikipedia search on Empress Wu because she was a fascinating ruler. Uh, and it's block printed onto hanji, which is Korean handmade paper made from the inner bark of the mulberry tree. And as Buddhism flourished in the Goryeo dynasty, which followed the Three Kingdoms era, um, we see other examples of beautifully illuminated manuscripts. This is the Lotus Sutra, which dates from 1340. And the main cover, which is shown on the right-hand side, and the illumination that you see in the middle are done in gold ink on indigo dyed hanji. And the calligraphy, which you see on the left, is in silver ink. And this is one of several great examples of the opulent uh, types of Buddhist manuscripts enjoyed during this period. And now I'd like to show you a video. This is by a master Korean calligrapher named Kim Gyung Ho. And this is um, him demonstrating the process of sagyong, which is the Korean term for illumination of Buddhist manuscripts. And this is done in 2012 for an exhibition held by Flushing Town Hall in New York for an exhibition that um, was called Samadhi plus Arts equals Sutra. And here he is loading up his brush, which has a traditional bamboo handle and white goat hair bristles. And you might notice how he holds his brush almost vertically this is indicative or typical for Eastern style calligraphy. And the style that he is writing is inspired by Tang Dynasty calligraphers from China. This is like the official Tang Dynasty block script. Here you can notice he's using the same materials to paint as he uses for calligraphy. So oftentimes painting and calligraphy were combined. Mm. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at the five main styles of calligraphy that Koreans adopted from China. We already saw an example of hengso, or sorry, heso, which is at the very bottom here. That's the Tang Dynasty inspired block script. If we go back up to the top, we have jeonso, which is the seal script. 
which was based on ancient Chinese characters, which were typically used for seals or inscriptions. And then next we have Yesol, which is the official script. And you would typically find Yesol on titles of important documents or for slogans at temples or palaces or Confucian academies. The third style is called Chosa, and this is my personal favorite style. Um, it's just the cursive script, and it allows you as a calligrapher to have the most amount of artistic freedom and self-expression. And then the fourth style that we see is Hengsa, which is a semi-cursive style. And this falls somewhere in between Chosa and Hesa. It's the most frequently used in everyday calligraphy. Okay. So for a little side-by-side -side comparison, we have an example on the left of Chinese calligraphy. This is a um, beautiful work by Chai Xiang, who is considered by many to be the most influential calligrapher from the Song Dynasty in China. And on the right, we have the work of Kim Jong-yi, who is arguably Korea's most famous calligrapher from throughout all of Korean history. And he lived in the Joseon Dynasty. And I also wanted to show you one of Kim jong ils many famous orchid paintings. Uh, Kim was known to create a unique pen name for every orchid painting he ever did, which is a fact that I find very endearing. Um, but if you look on the right side of the painting, you might notice that there's quite a bit of blank space or negative space. And this blank or negative space has a technical term in Korean. It's called yobek. And Yovek allows the viewer to have room or spaciousness from which one can then better appreciate or focus on the drawn lines or strokes. I find that to be a really beautiful concept. Okay, and now by contrast, we have a very colorful world here of Minhua, which is folk art in Korea. Um, on the left, we have a close-up of a panel from a folding screen. And this is a specific type of folding screen called munjado, which means character studies. And munjado uses Chinese characters, or hancha, to explore Confucian values. So here we have the character for justice, which is called yi. And then just to the right of that, in the middle, we have a different type of folding screen called chekkori. And chekkori um, typically just presents uh, items that you would find in a scholar's study. So examples would include instruments uh, for calligraphy, um, books, of course, ceramic vessels, flower arrangements, and the like. And then on the far right, we have natural pigments that are used to create these beautiful, vibrant ink colors. Um, to give you a few examples, in the upper left corner, we have uh, yellow earth, or huangto. We also have uh, yellow realgar. Let's see if I can use this pointer. Um, we have cinnabar right here, and red coral, which produce that vibrant scarlet shade, uh, which is used for sealing paste or stamps. We also have, for green, we have malachite. And I wish I could see the pointer. Here we go. There's malachite. And then for that almost shocking reflex blue light color, we have blue cobalt in the upper corner. Here we are. And we have azurite and lapis lazuli. And oyster shell provides this beautiful white color. OK. And calligraphy, even though it was mostly reserved for the upper classes to, to learn, uh, also found its way into the lives of everyday people from all classes. Uh, it's, it was used for interior decor as well as signage on doors for people's homes. And it was also used to write talismans, which you can see in the upper right. And talismans were designed to ward off evil and invite blessings. And then, of course, Calligraphy was used for centuries as a way for people to communicate with each other in the form of letter writing. So in the bottom right corner, we see an example of what a letter would look like. Um, and it's written with ink on hanji, 
and you can see that it's in Chinese characters, or maybe you can see it's in Chinese characters. And the format of Chinese characters starts from the top, and it has a vertical orientation. And we start at, at the top right. Here we are. And it reads from top to bottom, moving from right to left. And this is an example of a letter that my grandfather wrote to his mother back in the 1920s. And what kind of blows me about, uh, blows my mind about this letter is that it still looks like it was just written yesterday. Like the hanji is virtually unchanged or unfaded with time. Okay, so with the demand of Buddhist scriptures in the Korya dynasty, Wood blocks eventually were used to reproduce sacred writings, as seen earlier with the Dharani Sutra, and also with the uh, establishment of Confucian-based academies in Korea in the fourth century, we also see the rise in demand for Confucian classics. So wood blocks were also used to print those. And now I'd also like to show you a video clip from the National Hangul Museum in Seoul. And this shows you the process of carving and printing from a wood block. This is on printing wood blocks. And here we are in the workshop of a master uh, woodblock craftsman. So the first step, naturally, is to pick a piece of wood that's been cured. Typical woods used for wood blocks include maple, birch, wild cherry, beech, and persimmon. Also, he's using the world's cutest song. And then he planes the surface to make it totally smooth. And then he takes a sheet of hanji, which has calligraphy written on it, and he places it face down on the wood block. First using water, and then he uses a thin layer of oil to help the character show through the sheet. And this I feel like is the hardest part. <laughs> he hand carves every single letter form into the wood block. And I feel like as a craftsperson, this is where a wood carver voice enters in the process. Even though he might be trying to capture the essence or style of a calligraphy, he still has the responsibility of being able to capture all that detail. And now he's adding two end blocks, which are called naguri. And naguri are unique to Korea. You don't see them in Chinese or Japanese books. the surface, places a sheet of hanji or paper on top, and then he burnishes it until the inked letter form is transferred to the paper. And then he peels the sheet back. sheets that have been printed and folded in the same way, you can then pierce the stack of uh, folded sheets together and do a traditional stab binding. 
And one unique fact about Korean books is that for those that are bound with a traditional stab binding, um, Korean stab bindings have five holes, whereas Chinese and Japanese have four holes. Okay. Now this brings us to perhaps the most famous example of woodblock printing in Korea. This is a Tripitaka Koreana, which is the world's most complete collection of Buddhist scriptures. It was originally carved in the 11th century to invoke protection against the Khitan invasions from the north. And it resulted in a colossal effort <laughs> of the carving of more than 80,000 woodblocks. <laughs> Insane, right? <laughs> Um, also, what's fascinating about this is that in over 52 million Chinese characters, there isn't a single known error or typo, not a single errata. It's been checked against the Chinese and the Khitan versions. But in fact, this is so accurate that it served as a benchmark for subsequent versions of the Tripitaka for 700 years. And for sense of scale, if you look at the long skinny band, down below, can everyone see that? That just shows the width of this one scroll, which we see the larger photo above it. There are over 6,500 of these scrolls <laughs> in, the, in the complete collection. Um, two centuries after the original carving, in the 1200s, the Mongols invade Korea. And after almost three decades of Mongol invasions, the original set of wood blocks from the Tripitaka have been burnt, so they're totally lost to history. <laughs> and the king of Korea is so desperate that he orders for the, for the Tripitaka to be recarved, to invite more protection. So that process of recarving takes another 16 years, and the second version of, of the canon is finished in 1251. And the amount of effort that was required to produce the second collection has been likened by modern scholars to sending a man to the moon. All right, and then in 1398, the second copy of the Tripitaka was moved to a temple called Heinsa, which is in the mountains outside of Tegu. And they have remained there ever since. Um, the repository, which was specifically designed to store these wood blocks, which is seen on the right, was from an architectural standpoint, standpoint, ingeniously designed to promote both natural climate control and airflow. And the last piece I'll say before moving on about this particular work is that it was slated to be destroyed yet again, <laughs> this time in the 1950s during the Korean War, when UN forces ordered for the bombing of this temple. And I can't imagine that. A very brave soul, a member of the Korean Air Force, decided to go against direct orders. Can't imagine the courage that took. Um, but he thereby saved the temple and, and, and all of its treasures. So wherever he is, wherever his soul may be, blessings to him. <laughs> OK. So around the time that the first Tripitaka was carved in the 11th century, the Chinese made the world's first movable type out of clay. And then Koreans invented the world's first movable metal type in the early 1200s. And historical records mention books printed in Korea for movable metal type as early as 1232, although no known copy has survived as far as we can tell. So here we have the world's earliest surviving book printed from movable metal type. This is a book of Zen scriptures called Jikji. And this came out in 1377, about 80 years prior to Gutenberg's Bible. OK. <laughs> and about 70 years after Jikji, the king of Korea, King Sejong the Great, invented the Korean writing system that we now know as Hangul. And he bemoaned the differences between the spoken language that Koreans use in everyday life and the written writing system, which at that time consisted of Chinese characters. And he likened using hancha, or Chinese characters, to expressing Korean uh, 
to trying to fit a square handle through a round hole. And he was also quite progressive in his politics. He wanted all of his people to be able to express their concerns to him. And the vast majority of his subjects were illiterate because only the upper class elite could learn how to read and write in Chinese. So he developed 28 letter forms, which are shown in the upper part. Originally, they were called Hunmin Zhongnam in 1443. Four characters, which are shown in light blue, are no longer in use. They were dropped eventually. And we're left with the modern Hangul system, which you see below in the red section. And there are also some supplementary characters shown in black. And one defining characteristic of Hangul is that words are written in syllables or syllabic blocks. Um, and each block contains typically three characters. Usually there is an initial sound, a, me a medial or middle vowel sound, and an ending or third consonant sound. So here we see the word Hangul uh, broken into two syllables. Han stands for Korean. Gul stands for script. If we look at the first syllable Han, you can see the characters for H, A, and N grouped together. And similarly for Gul, we see the characters for G or K, the middle vowel of U, and the letter for L also grouped together. And one aspect that I love about the physical design of the letter forms of Hangul is the fact that the three main sounds are inspired by Chinese philosophy. So the initial sound is represented by a circle. See that? Or a dot, which represents heaven. The last sound is represented by a square or a flat or horizontal line, which represents the opposite of heaven, which is earth. And then the medial or middle sound is represented by a triangle or a vertical line. And that represents humanity as a connecting force between heaven and earth. I find that really beautiful. And in the triangle specifically, the tip or the apex of the triangle represents a person's head reaching for the heavens, while um, the base of the triangle represents a person's feet, which are firmly planted on earth. And together, the three parts form what is called the Sankeguk in Korean, and they represent the great ultimate, or the idea of a cosmos in harmony. Cool. And shortly after Hangul was invented, we see the emergence of Buddhist scriptures printed in Hangul script. This is Worin Sokpo, which came out just a few years after Gutenberg's Bible. The large characters are mostly in Korean, and some of the smaller text is a mixture of Korean and Chinese script. One thing to note about uh, Hangul is that after its invention, the upper class literati actually pushed back on Hangul, and they considered it as an inferior writing system to Chinese characters, which they believed was the only appropriate writing system. And they actually saw Hangul as a threat to their authority, too, because if the lower classes could learn how to read and write, then, um, hey, what does that mean for their position in society? Uh, so yeah, that mentality persisted all the way up until the end of World War II. Okay, So here we have what a typical printing frame looks like with metal type. Uh, we have vertical dividers made out of bamboo or metal and individual pieces of, in this case, Chinese type, are inserted by hand using a mixture of beeswax and castor or sesame oil to affix the pieces of type to the frame. And then the overall form is inked and printed just like a woodblock, where um, you apply ink, you lay down a sheet of hanji or paper, and you burnish the whole surface. Okay, so, how was metal type cast? Well, there is a process called lost wax casting, which I won't go into here because there's not a whole lot of scholarship to support it just yet. But the most common form of metal type casting in Korea was sand casting. And here we have uh, Master Yi Min Ho, who 
works at the Chengju Early Printing Museum, located a few hours south of Seoul, and he's demonstrating this process. Uh, he starts off on the left. He's packing one half of two parts of a round metal mold with sand. And then he takes small characters that have been carved out of wood in relief, kind of like a rubber stamp, if you will. And he presses those characters face down into the sand to leave an impression of each character. And then he, in the middle frame, he taps out each individual character to leave um, its impression. And I'll show you a brief clip of that. It okay. And so what's left is what you see on the right-hand side. You can see the impressions of each character made in the sand. And he also took a knife and he carved a channel leading from the mouth of the mold down into uh, each of the characters with these small branches or channels. And he repeats that on the other side or the other half of the mold. And then he places the two halves together. And here he is pouring. The metal flows in through the channels, enters the cavities where the impressions have been made by those wooden character forms, and that's how type is cast. Pretty cool, right? The ideal mixture for Choson era metal type was about 75% copper and maybe 23, 24% uh, tin, and the remainder, 1 or 2%, was usually uh, lead. Okay, and then he reopens the molds. Can folks see the metal branches? Yeah. And then once it's totally cool, he flips out these branch-like structures. He brushes them clean from sand and then he files down the individual metal pieces of type uh, and they're ready to print. And that's how it works. Okay, so in the 16th and 17th centuries in Korea, this period royally sucked <laughs> for Korea. Um, essentially the country had its behind handed to it uh, from a series of invasions. Starting in 1592, Hideyoshi Toyotomi led invasions to Korea from Japan, and during this period, he took all of the metal type that was in the country back to Japan, if he didn't melt it down first for military purposes. But he was very smart in that he not only took all the metal type, but he also took all the printers, all the typecasters, all the ceramicists, <laughs> the paper makers, you name it. He took them back to Japan so he could learn from their technology. So that set back Korean printing by almost a decade because Korea had to now find sources for metal in a country that was devoid of metal, uh, and they used wood type for the interim. Now, interestingly, but not surprisingly, uh, the first Japanese books that came out in the early 1600s were all printed from metal type from Korea by Korean printers, uh, but they were quickly abandoned. Like, the Japanese found handsetting thousands of Chinese characters by hand to be as cumbersome as probably anyone else would. So they reverted back to woodblock printing. And uh, the subsequent Edo period in Japan that followed is where we see the zenith of Japanese woodblock printing. And then one final question I'll pose before moving on to the next piece is, why didn't movable metal type create the same splash in Korea or East Asia as it did in Europe? Does anybody know? Any guesses? That's a good one. <laughs> Can you say that louder? 
Right, exactly. So movable metal type in the Chosun dynasty, which lasted for 500 years from 1392 to 1910, uh, was restricted and monopolized by the government. So the only people who could technically print were uh, government officials and people from the ruling elite, <laughs> the people who had education. So even though Hangul-based novels and literature and poetry did flourish uh, on the black market, it was definitely on the down low, uh, but officially books that were printed in Korea during this period were super limited edition and only seen by few eyes. Pair that with the fact that Hangul type, even though the Korean writing system is so much simpler than Chinese, still has over 10,000 syllabic block possibilities or combinations, made it such that a movable type in Korea did not create the conditions for the same kind of print revolution. Okay, so we'll skip ahead a bit in time. We'll come to the end of the Joseon dynasty. The late 1800s is when Korea is forced out of isolationism, and we see the introduction of Western and Japanese influences. Um, and in 1910, Korea officially becomes annexed into the Japanese empire, and Japanese is introduced into Korea as its official state language. Now, interestingly enough, <laughs> it took Westerners, and specifically, Western Christian missionaries to popularize Hangul in Korea. So they were eager to save Korean souls, but Western missionaries also printed the first Hangul dictionaries and language guides, in addition to all the Bibles they printed. Um, so along with salvation, they brought Western ideals of democracy, freedom from colonial rule, as well as modern medical care with hospitals and Western style um, education reforms. And so for the first time, we see schools being opened for women and children and girls, actually, um, who are now beginning to learn how to read and write in Korean script. The first newspapers also came out around the turn of the century. Um, many of them were associated with the underground resistance. Um, this is also the first time we see printing for the masses in Korea very first time in Korean history. Uh, on the far left, we see the Independence newspaper, which was published by an activist named Seo Jae Pil. Um, he later mentored South Korea's first president, who came into power after the end of World War II, uh, Lee Sung Lan. And on the right, we see the Korea Daily News, which was published by another activist uh, named Yang Ki Tak. Uh, in conjunction with a British journalist named E.T. Bethel. And Bethel, because he was a British subject, lucky for him, was not subject to local law. And he got away with a lot more than Korean-based newspapers for his generation. However, <laughs> because he was so vocal against the colonial regime, um, he was imprisoned and tortured, later killed for his efforts. And both newspapers were, in fact, shut down. So in this way, Hangul, promoted by Western Christian missionaries, uh, can be attributed to the rise of literacy in Korea for the first time. And it also became a symbol for freedom of speech and the independence movement. OK, so after a wave of demonstrations, which culminated in 1919 with the March 1st movement in Korea, um, colonial authorities slowly relax their grip on censorship in the media, and an explosion of vernacular press occurred in Korea in the decades that followed. In fact, the number of printing and bindery, um, bindery houses in Korea more than doubled during this period. And a new voice emerged in print, and it's the voice of women. <laughs> specifically a generation of educated and Western-leaning women who were eager to publish for the very first time their own writings, their own art, and discuss issues that were relevant to them. So on our left, we see a woodblock print by Korea's pioneer feminist figure, Na Hae-sok, uh, 
The piece is entitled, What is That? <laughs> and it refers to this woman who's in the foreground. And this is a young woman who's in Western-style clothing with a Western-style hairdo carrying a violin, obviously not an Eastern instrument. And she's caught in between two male gazes, right? So in the background, we have, um, where's my pointer? Thank you. So in the background, we see two Confucian men who represent the old vanguard. They're pointing their fingers at her, and they're saying, what is that? They do not approve. <laughs> and in the foreground, in the lower left corner, you can see a younger gentleman who has the opposite reaction. And he's also dressed in Western-style clothing. And he's looking at her with admiration and curiosity. And he wants to know who she is and where she's going. <laughs> but I feel like this woodcut perfectly encapsulates the modern woman's dilemma. <laughs> she's kind of in this transitional period between old and new, trying to forge a new identity. And on the right-hand side, we see the cover for Shin Yao Song, which translates to new woman, um, showing cubist references from the West. And this is from the September cover of their 1933 issue. Also, advertisements in the 30s were super fun to track. Um, on our left, we have an end of the year clearance sale poster at a women's clothing store in Korea. Um, even the concept of having a women's clothing store was still relatively recent <laughs> at that time. But you can see there are Western style buildings in the skyline above, this fashionably dressed young couple in the lower corner. Um, there's a lot more I could say about this poster. But uh, if we move over to the right-hand side, we see an advertisement that combines Japanese, Chinese, and Korean script. <laughs> this is an advertisement for a, for a Japanese men's hair product company. <laughs> it's selling hair pomade to guys uh, with Art Deco stylings. Um, love that consumerism hit Asia really early. <laughs> it's an early example of that. Okay, moving on, we come to the end of World War II. 1945 uh, is the year that Korea is finally liberated from colonial rule. But immediately after World War II ends, the Soviets take hold of North Korea and communism becomes entrenched in that portion of the country. And then communist troops invade the southern part of the country in the early 1950s and the Korean War uh, begins. During that period, thousands of leaflets like these were dropped from the skies in big balloon drops as part of psychological warfare. And on our left, we can see an example of an informational leaflet. Uh, it reads in big letters, Gyeonggo, which means warning. <laughs> and this is to warn civilians to stay away from unexploded bombs as well as popular military targets, like um, highways and freeways and military factories. And then on the right-hand side, we see an example of a more propaganda-based leaflet. And on the far right, you can see Kim Il-sung, who is North Korea's first military leader, who is portrayed as an ox or a cow. <laughs> he is pulling the rope, which is attached to the sickle held by Mao Zedong, the communist leader of China, portrayed here as the faithful servant of Stalin, who is the figure standing in the background, who in this picture is depicted as the great master. Yeah, so after a brutal period of conflict, uh, in 1953, Korea is officially divided at the 38th parallel into North and South. Okay. And the decades that followed the war were marked by a lot of struggle and also a huge amount of pressure to rapidly rebuild in the country. And Hangul in this period is still evolving. It's still somewhat unstandardized. So a lot of measures are being taken 
or, or being instituted during this period as well to standardize its usage. Um, Hangul type design focused on utility and, on, and it focused on promoting stability as well in the chaos of this era. And Che Jung Soon is one of the two main figures in type design from this period. He opted uh, to follow the Western standard of writing from left to right. This is where Hangul changes from its vertical format, uh, reading top to bottom, right to left. Che Jung Soon changed that and he, he followed Western standards of writing. He also changed the way numbers were portrayed. Up until now, Hangul used Chinese characters to depict numerals, but Che Jung Sun opted to use Western Arabic numerals. And the other main type designer from this era to note is Che Jung Ho. Um, he developed the basis for practically all contemporary Hangul fonts. Um, here we see his sketches from Myeongjo, which is on the left, which he designed for Morisawa and Shaken, which are two major Japanese type foundries. And they're based on Japanese versions of Mincho. Uh, for those who, of you who are familiar with Mincho, uh, they're actually originally inspired by Chinese type, <laughs> which uh, is based on the Ming dynasty style of calligraphy. So the word myeong in myeongjo and the word min in mincho from the Japanese uh, both refer to Ming style calligraphy. And the guy who designed the mincho type uh, faces in Japan, Motogi, who's like the godfather of Japanese type, <laughs> actually was inspired by Ming style type that was cast by a Westerner. <laughs> by an American, no less, who was living in China in the late 1800s. And he was there for, um, surprise, surprise, uh, for printing Bibles <laughs> to uh, try to convert Chinese souls too. But anyway, on our right-hand side, we see a contemporary poster designed by Yun Minggu, who's a talented type designer based in Seoul and Lausanne. Um, you can see in the background, there's a super black, Gothic typeface. That was inspired, it's a contemporary font, just published a few years ago, but it was inspired by um, Choi Jung Ho's original Gothic type sketches. So here we see sketches from Yangjo, which became like the Times New Roman for its generation. We still see it used in print today. And his sketches for Gothic became almost like the Helvetica, if you will, for that generation too, and became the foundation for virtually all Hangul grotesques. Okay. In the 1980s in South Korea, which was still under military dictatorship at this time, still not a full democracy, a group of artists came together and they formed the Minjung Arts Movement. And um, they used woodblock carving, which is an ancient technology, combined with modern comic book stylings and graphics and poster art to depict the political struggles of that generation. And here we see the work of Hong Song Dam, uh, who was a main figure in the Gwangju uprising in 1980, which is where thousands of protesters, most of them university students, clashed with military forces in the streets of Gwangju. And, even though South Korea has come a really long way since the 1980s, political issues are still present in the country. And here is a block print by my favorite contemporary South Korean woodcut artist named Lee Yoon Yop. And uh, this is his version of Article 1 from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he published this on the eve of Human Rights Day in December of 2016. I don't know if you can see, but I love his seal in the lower right corner. Can folks see? It's like a little puppy. <laughs> and I would be remiss if I didn't mention this gentleman, um, An Sang Su, who is the godfather of contemporary Korean type and graphic design. Uh, on the left-hand side, we see his seminal An Sang Su font from 1981. This is the very first 
Korean typeface designed to break Hangul out of its historical box or square framework. And if you notice in the lower section of this particular character, see that empty or yolbek, <laughs> the negative space here? He intentionally inserted blank space to stretch Hangul out. Really cool idea. An also found at the Paju Typography Institute in Seoul. Well, actually, it's outside of Seoul, it's in Paju City. Um, which offers four-year undergrad as well as postgraduate studies in type design. Also, Un designed a typeface inspired by, the, by Korea's most famous Dada's poet, Yi Sang. Um, check out how these characters on the left are written out. Right? Again, he's broken Hangul out of its box. Here he displays characters individually, reading from left to right. And this actually refers to an experimental form of Hangul that was called online script, which was briefly used and then later dropped because it was so inefficient. Um, you can see an example of that on the right-hand side. We have a certificate from 1916 um, for a Hangul Institute or school. And here again, we see examples of Munjado or character studies expressing Confucian values, and chekkori, which show scholarly uh, study accoutrements. And on loved Munjado specifically. And he ended up taking the concept of Munjado and giving it a twist, where he introduced Hangul, or Korean type, and combined it with Chinese characters to form hybrid characters. <laughs> In a recent exhibition, at the Seoul Museum of Art. And the concept here is called holuyura, which literally means to be immersed. And it reflects An's belief that any creator, in order to produce good creative work, must first be immersed in something. So if you look in the upper section of each of these large paintings, and if I took a look some more, can you, can you all see examples of Korean character forms? And then down below, you see the more curvy calligraphy-like uh, strokes from Chinese characters. Yeah. And then here we see two posters that show uh, examples of contemporary hanja, or Chinese, and hangul, or Korean type design. On our left, we have Hong Wenju and Kim Youngjae. Uh, they did a series of web graphics for the Seoul Museum of Art. On our right, we have the very talented An Mano, who is a senior graphic designer at On Graphics, uh, which coincidentally was founded by An Sang Su. And two more examples of lettering uh, done by Hyun Sung Jae of Zest Type. I find him one of the most prolific <laughs> and most diverse Korean lettering artists and type designers today. On our left, we have the word for nose which is ko, and on our right, we have the word for flower, which is ko, and I love how it almost looks like a flower, <laughs> but the lines are intended to kind of resemble the lines that you would get from a pantograph. And uh, Hyun also teaches at the Hangul Typography School in Seoul. Okay, and so we come to a close tonight, and I leave you with just a few more images to remind you of the many aspects of uh, Korean calligraphy, type, and print. And uh, I hope this evening has offered you just a taste of the incredible lettering and print culture in Korea. Thank you. So in the last example that you showed of the holly, holly whatever, uh -huh. yeah. um, is that something that would be legible, readable to both uh, Chinese speakers and Korean speakers, or is it just shape? I think it might be to people who understand Chinese. Mm -hmm. I mean, so f I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure, but my guess is probably not. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. 
because Munjado was based on Chinese, traditional Chinese, mm -hmm. and Chinese since then has been radically simplified. So even the Chinese characters that my parents learned, which was like a couple thousand characters, has been cut in half at least. Wow. Yeah. Hi. Um, I took maybe like three days of Korean language study, and uh, within like a few hours, you can almost start to learn how to write. Is there any other language that compares to that? I mean, there's a certain beauty that is almost immediately apparent from the structure of the written language in terms of its mm -hmm. efficiency um, for sort of acquiring and learning how to write. Mm -hmm. Not that I know of. <laughs> I've, I've read one uh, academic paper that says that Hangul has been studied by a, a council of linguists and has determined to be the easiest writing system to learn in the world. I don't know how actually accurate that is, but that's one finding that I found in my research. Okay, here's another. I was wondering, um, so I'm, you mentioned that there are like 10,000 characters or something, which is, I mean, of course, like that's gonna be hard to cut wood blocks out of, but like now if you're doing, um, or, or metal type, but if you have for digital type, how much of that is gonna be able to be copied and pasted or like using components or something because there are repeated forms where they're just kind of in different parts. Are you talking about metal type in Hangul or wood um, blocks? Oh, well, I mean, I, I guess, um, well, Hangul, but I guess metal type, but also, I mean, also now in digital typography where it's easier to reuse things, like how much can be reused to make all this big character set? Mm. I'm not sure I follow, <laughs> but um, I mean, one reason why wood blocks persisted for such a long time in Korea, and I can all see this, is that because once they were carved, even though they, they did require time, um, they could be stored almost indefinitely. And so you didn't have to go through the process of redistributing <laughs> all that Hangul type, which was such a pain in the patootie. Um, and once you had a wood block, you could reprint for centuries to come. So that was one main advantage that woodblocks had over metal type. Thank you.